The crashing market is not housing. In fact, if anyone is telling you that it is, they're either one, misinformed and don't understand the data, or two, they're doing it for some reason. There's some incentive for them to tell you that the housing market is crashing. And with that said, I believe it's the second more than anything else. If you're not aware, fear spreads faster than anything else, especially here on YouTube, where fear spreading videos get clicks, get virality, and ultimately give people what they're hoping for, and that's a housing market crash. But in all reality, Reality, the news isn't as bad as people want to make it out to be. But at the same time, the picture isn't quite as rosy as well. In today's video, we're going to talk about what the Fed is up against, what they're currently doing, and how that's likely to affect the housing market over the next couple of months. Now, before we dive into that, I want to take a minute and ask a favor. If you find any value in my videos at all, do me a favor and hit that thumbs up. It helps the YouTube algorithm push it out to more people like you. And if you enjoy content like this, do me a favor and hit that subscribe button. At the moment, you have the tale of two forces. One, the Fed trying to bring down inflation while keeping the economy from crashing, trying to provide that soft landing, if you will, and at the same time, keep housing affordability in check. Keep both rents and prices from rising too much too fast like they did over the last couple of years. And whether or not you want to believe this, the Fed is the one that actually created this mess. Mohammed Al-Aryan, the chief economist at Allianz, warns that the Fed is making the biggest mistake they have in several decades. He believes that the U.S. Central Bank reacted to the inflation surge a little bit too late, essentially allowing the pendulum to swing way too far to one side, and then came in with super aggressive monetary policy about a year ago, in fact, aggressively hiking the Fed funds rate, creating financial instability. In fact, we've seen it in a series of bank failures over the last couple of weeks. On top of that, we have several that believe we have renewed recession warnings as banking turmoil leaves economic confidence in tatters. As you can see from this chart here, inflation is still well above the Fed's target goal of 2%, which is ultimately what the Fed says they're trying to accomplish, is bringing inflation down. And they're doing that by slowing economic growth, by raising the Fed funds rate. And they've even said that they know unemployment numbers are going to rise, creating additional unemployment. But so far, the numbers have remained pretty strong with employment, which has given the Fed the green light to continue with their aggressive stance. And that's exactly why why we have Fed officials out there believing that we should still continue to raise the Fed funds rate above 5% and even keep it there long term. But here's the thing, what the Fed is doing now doesn't necessarily affect the economy at the moment it has a trickle effect. It takes a couple of weeks, a couple of months for this to actually show in the data. So essentially what Mohammed Al-Aryan was saying that this could end up being the biggest Fed policy mistake in decades. And that's because instead of waiting to see how their super hawkish stance is playing out, what they're doing is front loading it, if you will, doing it as quickly as possible to hopefully quell inflation with absolutely no regard for jobs. And here's the thing, even a common man like myself, not an economist, not some super smart guy with an IQ of 180, but somebody that understands data and how data works. Again, it doesn't happen immediately, it happens over time. And we know that what the Fed has done is going to start to play in the numbers here real soon. In fact, this week we have CPI numbers for March. Now, I know a lot of people out there are on the edge of their seat hoping that we see a big jump in the inflation numbers coming down. But as you can see from this chart here that we posted a couple of months back, in fact, we posted this back in January, the expectations for the March inflation is that we're going to have a low replacement on core and a high replacement on shelter, which basically means it's going to be hard to see any meaningful progress in those numbers. And at the moment, the consensus is a 5.2% reading for the March numbers. So if you see inflation coming coming in at 5.2%, that's essentially what the market is expecting. So you're not going to see anything crazy, even though it does show that inflation is coming down. But here's the key, it's still 3.2% above their target, which in the Fed's minds gives them the authority to continue hiking unless they start to see disappointing data, which is exactly what's starting to show up in some of the employment numbers. In the latest numbers, we're starting to see a labor market cool down, with the US economy only adding 200 and 36,000 jobs in March. Now, for a lot of you watching, you're saying, well, the economy is still adding jobs. That's a positive thing. And it is a positive thing. That's a good thing. In fact, it supports the Fed's idea that we still have a strong labor market. But at the same time, we're seeing those numbers slow because hiring is starting to slow. In fact, while overall growth was still really strong, March showed the slowest pace of private sector hiring since February.
February of 2020. Non-farm payrolls grew by 236,000 compared to the estimate of 238,000. So again, not a huge miss, but well below the revised estimate of 326,000 in February. So while the job count declined from last month, the report was still strong and more or less in line with forecasts. So with that, the feds put themselves in a very difficult position because they still want to stamp out inflation. They still want to bring inflation down to their 2% target, which ultimately is going to happen as we start to see revised numbers in shelter data, revised numbers in the core data. But here's the thing, they're not looking out into the future, they're looking at right now. But on the flip side of that, they've already seen that they're aggressive stance is having a toll on the banking industry. And if I had to guess, we haven't seen the end of that turmoil either. But with that, we've started to see weakness in the JOLTS data, which is the job openings and labor turnover data. We've started to see weakness in ISM. We're starting to see employment come down, which ultimately tells me that the Fed is probably really, really close to pausing. And with all of that disappointing data, what we've seen is the 10-year tick down. And with that, mortgage rates have fallen for the fourth week in a row, which is exactly why Redfin is reporting that early stage home buying demand is hitting the highest levels that we've seen since May of last year, in addition to home prices jumping after several months of declines. According to Black Knight, we saw the strongest one month gain since May of last year, with home prices rising just under 1%. But don't get too crazy out there because home prices are still sitting at 2.6 below last year's peak, according to Black Knight. Of the 50 largest US markets that Black Knight follows, 39 of them saw an increase in home prices in February, whereas last November we saw 48 out of 50 seeing a decline. So what's actually creating this frenzy in the market? For one, the fourth quarter of the year is typically a slower time in the market anyway. So the housing market is naturally going to slow down during that time. Now, the last couple of years are a little bit abnormal because interest rates were so low, inventory was low, we had a lot of buyer demand out there. In fact, we had a lot of buyer demand pulled forward because of those super low rates. So as interest rates started to go up, buyer demand started to drop off, we started to see less buyers out in the market, and that's exactly why we saw a decline. But if you heard me a moment ago, we're only sitting two. 0.6% below the peak from last June. So again, I started the video by saying the housing market is not crashing. It is completely normal to see housing prices down, move sideways after seeing a 30 to 40% run up in just a two year period of time. And while a lot of people out there believe that everything that goes up must come down, that's not true. Now, I do agree that home prices can't continue to rise at that pace, but that doesn't mean they need to crash. Home prices on average have gone up 4.6% for the last 60 years. And please understand, that's not in a straight line. Some years you get a 5, 6% appreciation. The next year you might get 2 or 3%. It's an average over a 60 year period. So what happens when home prices increase 30 to 40% in order to get back to that trend? You need home prices to move sideways, slightly down, maybe even slightly up a little bit, allowing us to get back to that long-term trend line. But at the moment, we have an additional problem, which is low inventory, which is creating another layer to the whole issue as interest rates decline. So there's a lot of buyers on the fence and we've seen those buyers jump off the fence as interest rates come back down. But this is putting further strain on the housing market, especially here in Southern California, where inventory levels are at levels that we saw back in April of last year. So while we did see inventory rise towards the second half of last year, we've actually seen all of that inventory disappear, which is once again creating a frenzy in the housing market because you have a lot of buyers out there and not a lot of supply, with many home buyers out there thinking that rates may move back higher again, so they're trying to get in before that happens, putting further strain on housing housing prices and housing affordability. So for now, the housing market is unbreakable, but the future of the housing market has everything to do with the direction of interest rates.